The year is 1961, and the U.S. is in the middle of the space race against the Soviet Union, a fight for dominance over the skies and heavens above Earth. John F. Kennedy was inaugurated into office on January 20th, and less than three months later, the Soviets beat America yet again by sending the first human into space, Yuri Gagarin. Still reeling after the shock of Sputnik being launched into space only four years earlier, the U.S. was under immense pressure to speed up their own space program or risk being eclipsed by the USSR. On May 25, 1961, only four months after his inauguration, President Kennedy delivered a speech to Congress with a seemingly impossible goal, to land a man on the moon by the end of the decade. It had only been a month since the failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion in Cuba, and Kennedy was under immense pressure to deliver some kind of success for the American people. But to many at the time, this seemed impossible. At this point, the most that had been accomplished was that, earlier that same month, an American named Alan Shepard Jr. had been put in space for approximately 15 minutes in a suborbital flight. However, Kennedy's speech and the drive to be the best was just what the U.S. needed to accelerate the space program. completing full orbits of Earth, spacewalks, and even flying to the moon and returning back to Earth. By 1969, the seemingly impossible dream of having a man walk on the surface of the moon seemed not only attainable, but inevitable. And on July 21st, 1969, after a five-day trip to make it to the lunar surface, the dream was realized. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first two men to walk on the moon making history and setting the greatest scientific milestone man has yet achieved. Those two men and Michael Collins, the command module pilot, came back to Earth heroes, symbols of not only America's dominance over Russia in space, but humanity's dominance of space itself. However, even knowing the risks they faced, it could be easy to look back at these events like they were preordained, that they were inevitable, but that's simply not the case. The risks that everyone involved with the Apollo 11 mission knew about or took part in were great, and the mission was far from flawless, with the computer on the lunar lander giving program alarms and requiring a manual confirmation that the mission was still safe to continue without aborting. And as the failed Apollo 13 mission showed, something as simple as an oxygen tank being disturbed could lead to an entire crew barely making it back home alive. So, what if the greatest scientific success in human history had failed, and the crew of the Apollo 11 mission, instead of returning home as heroes, were forced to remain on the moon? Well, President of the time, Richard Nixon, was prepared for such a scenario, asking presidential speechwriter William Sapphire to write a speech for President Nixon to deliver, in the case of a disaster where the Apollo 11 mission failed and the crew were unable to make it back to Earth. It reads, <clears throat> Fate has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. These brave men, Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin, know that there is no hope for their recovery, but they also know that there is hope for mankind in their sacrifice. These two men are laying down their lives in mankind's most noble goal, the search for truth and understanding. They will be mourned by their families and friends. They will be mourned by their nation. They will be mourned by the people of the world. 
they will be mourned by a mother earth that dared send two of her sons into the unknown. In their exploration, they stirred the people of the world to feel as one. In their sacrifice, they bind more tightly the brotherhood of man. In ancient days, men looked at stars and saw their heroes in the constellations. In modern times, we do much the same, but our heroes are epic men of flesh and blood. Others will follow and surely find their way home. Man's search will not be denied, but these men were the first, and they will remain the foremost in our hearts. For every human being who looks up at the moon in the nights to come will know that there is some corner of another world that is forever mankind. On July 18th, 1999, Sapphire discussed the speech with NBC, saying that the speech was written as something to do about the Widows, because getting the lunar lander back into space and to attach to the lunar module orbiting a moon would be the most difficult and most dangerous part of the mission, and there was a very real chance the astronauts would have to be left on the moon. In this event, Mission Control would have, as they called it, deliberately closed down communications, simply meaning the astronauts would either starve or take their own lives. Now, it is unlikely that they would wait for the lack of food to overtake them, and would instead take matters into their own hands. However, despite rumors and even claims from astrophysicist Carl Sagan that NASA astronauts carried cyanide pills with them, it seemed as though they never had. Apollo 13 commander Jim Lovell said as much, and that he had never even heard of such a thing, so it was likely a rumor created by media and perpetuated by films such as Contact. What would likely happen is that the astronauts would let the vacuum of space take their lives, rendering them unconscious and ultimately leading to asphyxiation in what would be both a less painful and even faster death than if they had ingested cyanide, as rumors would have suggested. Back home on planet Earth, the nation would mourn the loss of two astronauts as Michael Collins would be brought back home, a hero still, but one of tragedy and not triumph. The nation, NASA, and even the president himself would take a hit to their image and their ratings, with the dream of getting a man on the moon by the end of the decade fading quickly. However, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin would not have been the first to lose their lives in the pursuit of science, and they would certainly not be the last. So NASA would revamp its efforts for the Apollo 12 mission, ensuring whatever failed during the last mission was resolved, and try again before 1970 came around. In our timeline, Apollo 12 launched in mid-November, and so they would have another month in this timeline to investigate the problems further before resuming the goal of landing a man on the moon and bringing them back before the year ended. In this pursuit for NASA to recover their glory, Armstrong and Aldrin would become martyrs and heroes, given posthumous awards, statues, and the highest honors the world could give them. The first thought that may come to your mind is, where would Russia be in all of this? Well, to put it plainly, they wouldn't be on the moon. There was a reason that they never launched a rocket of their own to take someone to the lunar surface, and that reason lies with the N1 rocket, the only hope Russia ever had to beat America in the final leg of the space race. On July 3rd, 1969, only 17 days before the Apollo 11 lander made contact with the moon's surface, the Russians had tested their own moon rocket, known as N1. US spy satellites saw complete destruction at the secret test site in Kazakhstan, showing a total failure of the rocket test. This was actually the second launch of the N1 rocket, and even though the first one, launched February 21st of 1969, had also failed, they believed that they had learned enough to try again. However, the July 3rd launch wasn't just a failure, but a disaster, leading to the complete destruction of half of the launch complex and pieces of the rocket to be strewn across the land for miles. They did do some more tests of the N1 rocket over the next couple years, although they also all proved unsuccessful. By 1974, the Kremlin pulled the plug on the moon program, seeing it as both a waste of money and a waste of time. In this timeline, where the Apollo 11 mission failed, there may have been enough energy pumped into the Soviet program 
to continue their moon landing research for several years more, but it's unlikely they would find any more success than they did in our timeline. American success was eventually inevitable, even if there were failures and disasters along the way, because the technology was all there for NASA and its space program. The Soviets were simply behind in technology. So, ultimately, the biggest difference you would see between this timeline and ours is that when Apollo 11 is talked about, it would be with the same kind of reverence and honor that come when discussing the Columbia and Challenger disasters. Americans that, in the pursuit of the advancement of humanity, paid the ultimate price, and would be forever remembered in the hearts of the world because of it. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and leave a like. It really helps me out. Subscribe to stay up to date with my videos, and ring the bell next to it to get notified for when I do upload new videos. If you want to stay up to date with what's going on with me or my channel, go follow my Twitter. This has been Historical Hindsight, and I'll be seeing you soon.